The Bible is filled with contradictions, or so say most atheists and many other opponents of Christianity. But is it really true? This video is the first in a collaborative series between myself and Cole from Practical Faith. Each video stands on its own, but if you're not already doing so, you may want to watch from the playlist in order to see the videos in order. Then subscribe to both our channels to make sure that you don't miss any future installments of the series. Links to the playlist and Cole's channel are found in the description box of this video. I will introduce the subject by looking at what Scripture says about itself in order to understand what is at stake. Without further ado, let's dive in. First, a couple quotes from critics to set the stage. American Humanist writes, The Bible is an unreliable authority because it contains numerous contradictions. Atheist.org is a little less nice about it. What is incredible about the Bible is not its divine authorship, it's that such a concoction of contradictory nonsense could be believed by anyone to have been written by an omniscient God. Before getting into the heart of the matter, it's important to think about what is really at stake for Christians. Is our faith based on the inerrancy of the Bible? Or is it based on the deity, death, and resurrection of Jesus? Do we believe that the Bible is a word-for-word -word dictation from God, as Muslims claim about their own scriptures? or that it's a divinely inspired translation of a golden tablet, as Mormons claim about their scriptures? Or is our confidence in Christianity based on encounters with a living God, both those in the past and our own? Even if it is true that the Bible contains contradictions, which I don't think it is, does it really follow that Christianity is untrue and that only a fool would believe in it? Let's take a look at what Scripture says about itself. Speaking about his own authority, Jesus remarks, But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John, the Baptist. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard. His form you have never seen and you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe in the one whom he has sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. In this passage, Jesus indicates that the purpose of scripture is to bear witness about him but he also takes a somewhat derisive view of the Jewish leader's view of Scripture. They think that words on pages give them life, while rejecting the actual source of life, Jesus himself. Furthermore, Jesus' authority is apparent from his works alone. In a related passage, the opening lines of the book of Hebrews declares, Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. There are a few things of note here. First of all, the phrase, in many ways. There isn't just one method of inspiration. God didn't just dictate the entire Bible one day, but rather worked in history to produce a book filled with many different types of writings. Additionally, there is an implicit statement that the revelation revealed in the person of Jesus is superior to the written word that preceded it. In 2 Peter, we read, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by his Holy Spirit. In context, prophecy is clearly a subset of Scripture. Note that while the passage clearly teaches that prophecy comes from God, it does not say from God alone, but rather through men aided by the Holy Spirit. God doesn't turn the prophet into an automaton, a mere machine to record dictation, but rather works through him, carrying him to the goal. This is perhaps meant to indicate that the style and personality of the prophet was retained in the writing. 
Also of note is the fact that prophecy is singled out. This might just be due to the context of the quote, but it does leave open the possibility that prophecy is a special case, and other forms of scripture are inspired in a less direct manner. The idea of inspiration through the Spirit is not a new one of Peter, but rather an ancient Jewish idea. For example, Numbers 24.2 reads, And Balaam lifted up his eyes, and saw Israel camping tribe by tribe. And the Spirit of God came upon him, and he took up his discourse and said, Balaam was able to speak on behalf of God through the influence of the Holy Spirit. But note, of course, that the whole book of Numbers was considered inspired, not just this short passage, suggesting that the Jews already understood multiple methods of inspiration in ancient times. Although not usually considered scripture, 4 Esdras makes clear the Jewish conception of scripture in Jesus' time. The author prays, If then I have found favor with you, send the Holy Spirit into me, and I will write everything that has happened in the world from the beginning, the things that were written in your law, so that people may be able to find the path, and those who want to live in the last days may do so. It is clear that the author of this passage is asking the Holy Spirit for inspiration, in order to be able to accurately write the things of God, but there's no hint of expecting exact words to be put into his mind. Finally, no survey of inspiration would be complete without looking at 2 Timothy. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation, through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Here, Timothy is encouraged to hold on to his faith based on the reliability of his teachers and of Scripture. Scripture makes one wise, that is, it gives the knowledge necessary for salvation. Scripture does not, however, save. That is accomplished by faith in Jesus. Scripture can teach, correct error, and train people to live righteous lives, and to make one ready to serve God. Notice what it does not say, though. There is no claim that Scripture contains an exact chronology of events. There is no claim that it teaches minor details about history. There is no claim that Scripture speaks of how nature works. And there is certainly no claim of word-for-word -word dictation from God. Even the phrase, breathed out by God, which is all one word in the Greek, gives a strong hint that Scripture is not, literally speaking, God's speech. If Paul wanted to say that God spoke the words, he could have easily done so. Instead, he says that Scripture is infused with God's breath or spirit, which is the same word in both Greek and Hebrew. God works to ensure the writer makes Scripture profitable for teaching, and so on. But none of these things demand perfect accuracy on trivial details. Just as we wouldn't insist a textbook that has one wrong word is useless, we shouldn't throw out scripture just because of one word. This means that if, and it's very much just an if, we can't work out how two differing accounts of the same event can both be true at the same time, at most it means we need to adjust our view of scripture. It should not affect our view of God. If there were contradictions in actual doctrine, that is what scripture aims to teach, that would be a real problem. But disagreement on incidental details should not bother us significantly. Thus the conclusion that we saw in the introductory quote that no one could believe the scriptures have been written by an omniscient God is totally irrelevant. It is in fact a poor character of Christian beliefs. We do not believe and have never taught that the Bible is the work of God alone, that it was a dictation from heaven. Rather, Christians believe that it is the work of God through the words of men. And when it comes to evaluating the general accuracy of the Bible, many critics have things exactly backwards. Imagine the following scenario. There is a party at your workplace while you are out of town. 
When you get back, you ask a coworker how the party went. They say it was pretty fun and talk about a game mentioning Amanda, Tim, and Sally. Later, you talk to a second coworker and they share a similar story about the game, but they mention Amanda, Tim, Sally, and John as players of the game. What do you conclude from these stories? Well, if you were a biblical critic, you would probably conclude that neither of your coworkers were at the party and that the second one had probably copied the story he heard from the first, but then added John as an additional character for some unknown theological reason. And then you would doubt that the story had any basis in fact to begin with. Now imagine a second scenario. You're the detective trying to solve a robbery at the local grocery store. You interview two eyewitnesses. The first says they were waiting in the checkout lane when a man about six foot two tall, wearing a red shirt with orange stripes, approached the cashier and threatened him with a butcher knife, demanding he empty the till into a cloth bag. You ask this eyewitness what he was doing at the store, and he says he came to buy some milk, bread, and a dozen eggs. You ask him if he knows when the robbery took place, and he says he looked at his watch and that it was precisely 3.03 p.m. When you interview the second eyewitness, he says he was waiting in line to check out when a six-foot-two tall man wearing a red shirt with orange stripes approached the cashier and threatened him with a butcher knife. He demanded that the cashier empty the till into a cloth bag. This eyewitness also says he came to the store to get eggs, bread, and milk, and that the robbery took place at precisely 3.03 p.m. What do you conclude? If you are well trained, you will instantly recognize that the two men have talked to each other about what they will tell the police. You'll probably be suspicious that they're covering something up and at minimum conclude that their testimony can't be trusted. I, for one, am quite glad that the Gospel accounts contain discrepancies. This is a mark of legitimate testimony. When a Bible critic looks at two different accounts and sees differences, they invent a story about why the author changed this or that to fit some imagined theological disagreement. When a historian sees differences in two accounts, they get excited. It is not uncommon for important events in ancient history to have only been recorded in one account that survives to the present day. A second source, which matches the first exactly, is useless. It means one author copied from the other. A second source with differences, however, gives an opportunity to check the reliability of both texts. Do they paint the same picture, or is one embellishing things? It's not my main purpose today to argue for the reliability of the scriptures, so I'll just skip to the conclusion. Many lawyers, detectives, historians, and others trained to evaluate evidence have examined the Gospels, sometimes with an intent to disprove them. Objectively, the Gospels fare exceptionally well to such scrutiny. They have the amount of variation one expects from independent witnesses while containing the same core truth. This is not to say that the Gospels are completely independent. There is certainly a literary relationship between the synoptics, and Luke himself says he used many sources to compile his account. Rather, I'm saying all the Gospel writers had access to independent information, and that they accurately transmitted the information they had to us. Today, Anyone can go to a bookstore and buy a Harmony of the Gospels. This is not a new phenomenon. By the second century, Tatian had produced a Harmony of the Gospels which proved to be one of the most popular works of the early church. If they were so inclined, the church leaders could have probably substituted the Diatessaron, as his work was called, for the Gospels and avoided all the embarrassing differences between the accounts. The fact that they did not speaks to the integrity of the church. The early church knew the difference between the legitimate originals and later works, and they chose the original. Thus, discrepancies in the Gospels argue for their legitimacy and give us a means to test them via normal historical inquiry. It is not an accident or evidence of human error that our Gospels contain so-called contradictions. 
Rather, I believe it is a divinely inspired feature of the text. In the coming videos, Cole and I will examine some strategies for understanding the apparent contradictions we find in the Bible. We hope not to just give you a solution for specific discrepancies, but also give you strategies for thinking through these problems for yourself. When you do, you'll not only be awarded with greater confidence in our God, but also greater understanding of the Scripture. If you're watching from the playlist, the next video will start momentarily. If not, click the icon to my left or the link in the video description. Thanks for watching.